Hi, I want to thank you for coming to our presentation today. My name is Shandell Cummings. This is Alison Lulfitz, and we're from the UWA Albany Centre. Today, we're going to share some learnings uh, for conservation in a global biodiversity hotspot with both cultural values and Western science. So first of all, we'd like to acknowledge that we're sitting here in Nurningar country on the south coast and that this research was carried out across Noongar, Wudja. We're going to start by giving you a bit of an introduction to Nurningar, Wudja, um, then also going to some learnings um, from working together. Uh, we'll utilise five important Noongar plants to do that. Um, and then thirdly, we'll uh, talk about the picture or the big picture for biodiversity conservation in hotspot. So this is Murning Abuja. We are uh, taught to uh, introduce ourselves as Muriringa. Um, we extend from the western uh, war pole right through to Israelite Bay in the east, um, and that's Murning Abuja for us. Um, we classify ourselves as a shell peak show people for the South Coast region. Um, these particular photos show our intergenerational transfers that occur um, over very many years. Um, the bottom left photo shows uh, mum, Lynette Knapp, uh, working with Steve Hopper in a particular project where they have um, a, a very significant two-way learning process. Um, the top left photo shows mum and my baby brother, Harrison, uh, learning about fire burning practices. Um, the third photo from the left shows Nanny Bonnie overlooking uh, Miraninga Buja, um, Mum taking uh, Nanny Bonnie and Popeye out to places to look at country and check on country um, many, many years ago. And on the right, there's a photo of uh, me and my youngest, Billy. Um, Mum's also present at that particular um, that particular time and um, we're doing intergenerational processes and that particular photo is that is like bay. The first plant species we're going to talk about is yule, uh, which is a what we refer to as bush potato. Okay. Yep. So this is um so this is a species in species in the APAC family, which is the same family that you would find carrots and coriander and parsley. Um, and here's a photo of Annie Lynn instructing me on, on um, how to go about digging it up. So part of this project, we looked at the genetics of this particular plant. And what we found was that all of the populations that we looked at, so we sampled, I think it was about 11 populations. We found that they were all, there was individuals within those populations that were all very closely related to each other. Um, so there wasn't a lot of differentiation between populations that grew maybe 200 kilometres apart, but they were actually really quite closely related. They were either like siblings or first cousins or second cousins, but no more than that. So what do you think this could mean, Shan? It's probably very synonymous with um, how we are taught to harvest. So we go to specific locations. Um, usually this is a plant that would have been carried as a you know, it has a bit, it's a bit of a water source as well as um, extra nutritional value for children. Um, so you would have seen these at most of the camping spots, which would have been uh, in the vicinity of water or uh, nyamas, what we call water holes. And you can see it there growing next to a rock hole. Yes. Um, so another aspect of this project was that we harvested some yolk in plots and left others unharvested and look at, looked at at the, what happened, what the response was to harvesting. And what we found that um, was that it recovered really quickly in terms of the number of stems uh, that popped up um, following harvest. So you can see there in that graph that, um, that pretty much even the first year after harvest, the number of stems in that plot that was harvested was back to the number of pre-harvest. Um, the reason we looked at stems and not whole plants is that it's very clonal. It's really hard to tell. Um, which plant is which. Um, we also looked at um, the tuber volume and, and mass and we found that two years after harvest, when we dug them up again and harvested, that this hadn't really recovered in the same way. So the, there were, the tubers weren't back to that same level that they were before, um, which 
again makes sense to you. Yeah, it, it, that would be in line with us being told to go to specific places to um, harvest um, in cyclical years and also usually around every three to four years we'd go to the same location that we harvested three years prior. So two years is probably a bit quick. Two be. years too quick, yeah. yeah. Yep. And then the other thing that was interesting was that when we dug them up again in 2017, we also dug up control plots. And what we found was that in the ones that had been harvested only two years prior, there was a lot more baby ones, so um, which um, I guess they're better to eat. Yeah, and more preferable, yeah, yeah. and hold, hold more water as well. Yeah, so by harvesting them continually, they're, they're like renewing them. And, yep. Yep making them tastier like a baby carrot versus a woody old one that's been in the ground for a long time. Yep. So we also found that while York lives across a range of habitats, it actually is a lot more um, productive in fertile areas. So this graph on the side shows that the places where it's most fertile were where the biggest quantity of York was we dug out of the ground. So again, what does that mean to you, Shane? Probably an indicator of... Um, where we're told to go as well, so where there's been more rain um, or where the ground seems to be more fertile, where there's more plant species, that would be where we would harvest every three to four years. Tallyarch is also another significant species for Aboriginal people. This is our boundary uh, indicator, so this tells me when I'm in my country and when I'm out of my country. And so you can see the map of where it goes. It pretty closely responds to or coincides with where Merninga country is from the, the map that we showed you first up. And you can see there's actually two different species of Talarak that grow down here on the south coast. So, so there's that silver one and that green one. And that was something that was really exciting that came out of this project for you. Yeah, when, when we visited the Israel, Israelite Bay, we saw uh, Mum remembered the, those. this project triggered those memories of grandfather telling her stories about the green Talurak and where, where that was located. And when she saw spaces in Israelite Bay, it was almost like she'd, she'd been there before from the stories she'd been told. Um, but green Talurak is very significant. We are told that's where the true Noongar comes from. Um, so it's it's lawmen, so we call them waris, and that's the green talurak is their law boundary. Uh, Red-eyed wattle, the cyclops, is also another significant, culturally significant plant species. Um, this is an indicator that tells us where um, women and children would have camped, um, as these seeds would have been carried through. Uh, very significant uses, so the green wattle seed we would have or the green seed pod we would have used as soap, very um, uh, soapy when you mix water with it. Um, also the leaves do that as well. Um, and the seed we would have used to ground up and add into the cooked fish, which would have provided um, extra nutrition for children. And this this um, is also supported by science in a in a small small way. Um, in the, uh, a study that was done in 2019 that included this species showed really low levels of diversity between populations, again, coinciding with the fact that it would have been moved around. Um, but it would be great to do some further work on this species and, and look at it over the whole of Noongar country. So candy up grass, this is another really nice little story that's come out of our shared research mm -hmm. together. So candy up grass is one that Annie Lynn, uh, Shandell's mum, talked about and her dad would use it as a fish poison. And all she knew basically was that it was a grass that had blue flowers and it grew on this particular granite. And so when Steve Hopper, who's the chief investigator on this project, came and, and Annie Lynn looked at this plant together, Steve was able to put a scientific name to that plant and combine that with all of Annie Lynn's and Shandell's families. Um, traditional knowledge about this plant. And I guess what would, what would extend from that is does it grow close to fish traps? Does it grow close to places that people would hunt for gain? And as an extension of that again, would it be places that people would burn a lot? So there's, there's more questions that we can follow up there that would be pertinent to conservation of, of um, ecosystems. Uh, Muja is another very significant species as well. We believe this one to be our, we, it's our spirit holder. So 
another um, knowledge that's passed down through generations um, where this uh, is a protected species because it's highly culturally significant um, and quite a sacred, sacred tree. So we're also taught not to pick those flowers as we believe that those are our people coming back to look over country. So from a conservation point of view, I guess where Wamwaja grows, we would expect that that would have been not very much disturbed in traditional times by Noongar people. And what does that mean in terms of the, the ecology of that, that environment that it lives in um, is something that is worth further exploration. So why is Southwestern Australia a global biodiversity hotspot and how does this all fit into the bigger picture? So there's two reasons. Firstly, there's a good reason, and that is that there's this really high plant diversity within southwestern Australia. And secondly, a not so good reason, which is that it's been really heavily cleared. And this is illustrated in this map on the right that shows that the greatest density of threatened eucalypts in Australia or in the, in the world is actually in southwestern Australia. And this is just um, some on ground illustrations of those pressures as they play out across. Mooningar country. Um, these are all important cultural places to, to Mooningar and to Noongar people. And um, Shandu? It shows us the, the, the best way we can um, protect these places is actually by working together. So we call it a, a better way, walking and working together, um, being led by our elders and their knowledge. And finally, we would just like to thank you for listening and thank all of those people that we've showed there thank in you. this slide. Thank you.